July 4th, 1776, a marvelous experiment in democracy was conceived. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, its noble, if imperfect, parents pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor to bring to fruition this heroic idea, a new government in which all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. From birth, the fledgling American nation was a lofty work in progress, plagued by a double standard that enabled even its greatest leaders to engage in the practice of enslaving other human beings. It was a cruel anomaly that would continue to burden citizens of all races for decades, even centuries to come. Dutch settlers brought the first Africans to this new world in the early 1600s, and forced labor fueled the rapid development of colonial America. The plantation of John Dickinson still stands in coastal Delaware as a symbol of the ironic nature of the young republic. Dickinson was also a slaveholder. By the mid-19th century, the peculiar institution of slavery in the United States was more than 200 years old. America remained both a freedom-loving and slave-holding nation because slave labor, particularly in the South, remained the backbone of the agrarian economy. By 1840, cotton was the most valuable thing this entire nation exported. No, it was more valuable than everything else this nation exported put together. By 1860, the worth of slaves, the dollar value of slaves, was greater than the dollar value of all the banks, all the railroads, all the manufacturing facilities of this nation put together. Slavery was no sideshow in American history. It was the main event. The economies of the so-called eastern border states of Maryland and Delaware largely continued to rely on agriculture. With the exception of a few larger plantations, most slaveholders here on the Delmarva Peninsula owned fewer than five slaves. And with the changeover from labor-intensive crops like tobacco to more capital-intensive grain production, slaveholding in these states was becoming a financial liability. By this time, the northern states were firmly established as the center of American commerce and industry, and religious groups here now openly opposed the practice of slaveholding. An uncompromising abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, rallied anti-slavery sentiment with his newspaper, The Liberator. Our country is the world, wrote Garrison. Our countrymen are all mankind and new, strong voices of opposition were rising from the population of free black Americans, including former slave Frederick Douglass, the great orator and editor of another abolitionist paper, The North Star. These contingents refused to recognize the rights of slave masters and encouraged their captives to flee. Don't forget that these people were held on the plantation by more than just the white families on the plantation that ultimately, if you had tried to defeat the institution of slavery, you would have had to defeat the power of the plantation, the power of the local government, the power of the state government, and ultimately the power of the national government, that slavery was protected by the full force of the United States of America. So that when you think about people running away or people striking out against the institution, they are 
in embarking on a pretty ambitious uh, journey. Let's take a, a case in point. Let's talk about Minus, who was a slave not too far from Bridgeville, Delaware, in Sussex County. Minus, just before the Civil War, tried to escape. He tried three times. He was captured three times. Because immediately when a slave escaped, not only was the sheriff after him, and, his, and the sheriff had bloodhounds, but also there would be a posse made up of volunteer white people in the neighborhood. And once Minus was captured, he would be punished. This meant that every time he tried to escape, he would face punishment. So three times Minus would be punished. And the punishment would, of course, come from the whip, or it could be something else, but it would be very stern indeed. So to try to escape from slavery took a lot of courage because you knew that chances were you wouldn't get through the first time. For fugitive slaves in the border states, the terror of capture and sail to the Deep South was a fate equated with death. Being sold south meant being sold away from family members, never hearing, never seeing from, uh, of seeing them again. And it was the worst thing because it meant that person did not exist for you anymore. So that in less than, if you did not hear from a family member in about two months, the perception is that that person was dead. So you started a new life. It wasn't that they did not care for each other. It was simply that there was the impression that you would not hear from them, see of them ever again. They were dead to you. It has been said that most enslaved Americans resisted captivity in a thousand small ways. No doubt others who felt powerless to control their own destiny simply labored on until they died. Just the very fact that slaves had names that slaveholders didn't know, and the naming practices among slaves which linked families together, even people in families had been long sold away to make the point to those left behind that their relatives, though gone physically, spiritually were with them. That was a form of resistance in a variety of very imaginative ways African Americans resisted the institution of slavery and, and preserved their dignity as human beings. A few, like the dissident preacher and slave Nat Turner of Southampton County, Virginia, took matters into their own hands. Claiming a commission from Jesus Christ, Turner led a bloody revolt on slaveholding whites that resulted in the death of 61 men, women, and children. The incident sent shockwaves through the neighboring white communities. It terrorized slave populations living as far away as Carolina, who justifiably feared the brutal retribution that ensued. Today, the historic portrayal of the Turner Revolt remains controversial with some historians who question the methods used in the reporting of the incident. As the century wore on and the national debate intensified, the small state of Delaware came to embody the middle ground between North and South, between slavery and freedom. A number of rather remarkable things happened in Delaware. There were movements afoot that were challenging the institution of slavery. By 1810, only 24% of all African Americans in Delaware were still enslaved. So from 1775, when 95% of the African American population in Delaware was enslaved, suddenly it decreases to only 24% by 1810. It's because of this, this very strong abolitionist movement here in Delaware. Both Pennsylvania and Delaware had been charted by William Penn and heavily settled by members of a religious community known as the Society of Friends. The Quakers, as they were commonly called, harbored a religious contingent that had condemned the practice of slavery early on. Quaker worship services were called meetings, where men and women were encouraged to openly speak on issues of conscience. As early as 1776, the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting had directed all Delaware Quakers to free all of their slaves. It was part of a great awakening that included Methodists and other religious groups. There was a belief that American colonists had lost their spirituality and religious itinerant ministers traveled around this region preaching the gospel. 
As a part of that great awakening, more and more people began questioning the morality of slavery. Now, not every Quaker, not every Methodist, not every person held these strong beliefs, but there was, there, there was enough, I, I believe, at this point to encourage their fellow church members their fellow Delawareans to question the morality of owning their fellow human beings. Despite growing support from anti-slavery activists in the North, enslaved Americans, particularly those isolated in rural regions, continued to live in punishing conditions. Most were engaged in hard, brutal work for no pay. But cruelest of all was the constant threat of being sold. Harriet Tubman, who would become the Moses of her people, wrote, I grew up like a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty, having no experience of it. Then I was not happy or contented. Every time I saw a white man, I was afraid of being carried away. One fifth to one third of all slave marriages were broken when families were forcibly separated. Some opted to remain in bondage, lured by the promise of eventual manumission, but many others took their chances on fleeing north to the free states. There were many reasons why slaves sought to escape. One was the fact that there was no protection for family members, especially the women in the family. There was no protection for them, and they could be uh, sexually abused by the owner, by his sons, by friends, neighbors, visitors, what have you. And there was no punishment for that. It was merely the abuse of a slave, okay? The use of their owner's property. Frederick Douglass said, if a slave has a cruel master, he longs for a kind one. And if he has a kind master, then he longs to be his own master. The most important thing about slavery may not be the physical part of it, it's the psychological part of it that you are a prisoner and you don't have the freedom to do what you wish to do with your life. Your children are going to be prisoners for life as well. And in general, although there may be certain laws on the book, the master isn't really restrained in what he can do to you. In the end, enslaved Americans ran not so much from the cruelty of the master, but toward that most fundamental of all human rights, freedom. Not surprisingly, it was often the brightest, strongest, most skilled and daring who ran. It is thought that many fugitive slaves simply relocated anonymously in the same state, and that a relatively small number actually made it to the free north. It was not uncommon for months, even years to pass before family members would receive news of a runaway's safe passage. Fugitive slaves used a combination of courage, initiative, and mother wit to navigate. But the road to freedom was often long and treacherous, and many early escapes were unorganized and doomed to fail. But it did not stop them from trying. I have seen hundreds of escaped slaves, said Harriet Tubman, but I have never seen one who was willing to go back and be a slave. If a person would send another into bondage, he would, it appears to me, be bad enough to send him into hell if he could. Both federal and state law gave slave owners complete control over the life and death of their holdings, with little or no repercussions for violating their human rights. The worth of an average slave could be equated with the worth of an average car today. Some were worth more some less. Running away was considered theft of property, and slave catchers could hope to collect handsome rewards for the return of more valuable fugitives. For the most part, these entrepreneurs were also left to their own devices and posed a serious threat to fugitives and even free blacks. Oral tradition dictates that one of the more notorious and ruthless bounty hunters on the Delmarva Peninsula was a white woman named Patty Cannon. 
known as the Queen of Kidnappers and Murderers, Cannon and her interracial gang are said to have captured and sold large numbers of both fugitives and free blacks, chaining them to trees on small river islands a short distance below the Woodland Ferry on the Nanticoke River. When I interviewed my uh, great aunt Minerva Blockson at the age of 100, she lived to be 109, and I asked her, did she ever hear of Patty Cannon? And even this woman, who was at the age of a, in a hundred, she, her face became contorted. She said, the old folks used to tell us if we didn't behave, they would get Patty Cannon uh, after us. So even in her mind, Patty Cannon was a woman who operated a gang of thieves and cutthroats. And they would kidnap free black men, women, and children here. So can you imagine what my great-grandfather and his family felt living not too far from Patty Cannon? Cannon and her gang terrorized the region until 1829, when she was indicted and convicted of multiple murders. She is said to have poisoned herself while waiting to be hanged. Legend has it that the skull, stored in a hat box at the public library in Dover, Delaware, is that of Patty Cannon. As America moved steadily down the road to civil war, those who supported the movement toward freedom stepped up their efforts to undermine the rights of slaveholders. Free citizens, both black and white, who viewed slavery as the greatest immorality of the time, openly supported African-American initiative. Step by step, they evolved a covert network of conductors, routes, and hiding places known as stations all designed to assist fugitive slaves in getting north to the free states and even Canada. These pathways to freedom and the greater resistance movement became known as the Underground Railroad. There was an often told story that it started around the mid-1830s after the building of the railroads in the, uh, started in this country. Uh, some slave catchers were chasing a slave, and I believe the area was Ohio. And uh, he read, the slave ran away into a wooded area. And uh, the slave catchers followed him there, and uh, he suddenly disappeared. It was as if he ran away on an underground railroad. Well, it became a joke, but the joke caught on. When the uh, uh, abolitionists and the anti-slavery people got involved with helping slaves escape, they took that term on. And uh, those who were helping slaves escape, they called conductors. These were the people who went right into slave territory and uh, got the slaves and brought them out. And when they brought them out, they brought them to places where they could get food and shelter. And these places were houses or barns where abolitionists and anti-slavery people were at and they call these houses stations. And the people who lived in these houses and who provided this uh, information and this stuff, they called them station masters. And then others who became involved, like they, for example, they contributed money, they called them stockholders. And those who watched, they called them pilots. Any term that they used in the railroad, they used to describe the, the people who worked in the Underground Railroad. Both runaway slaves and those who helped them faced harsh penalties if discovered. In most instances, conductors, agents, and station masters remained anonymous, and fugitives were forced to trust in information that was often hearsay and passed on in a whisper. That any first-hand information exists at all concerning activity on the Underground Railroad is due largely to the remarkable efforts of one historian who is said to have operated the Grand Central Station of Underground Railroad stops. William Still was a free black man who first began work in the office of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society in 1847 as a janitor and clerk. His greater abilities were soon recognized and Still quickly rose to head the organization's General Vigilance Committee to aid runaway slaves. His duty as chairman was to keep a record of every fugitive that came to the committee, a mandate that brought him into contact with more runaway slaves than perhaps any other person on the Underground Railroad. Still interviewed hundreds of fugitives who passed through the office, 
meticulously recording the details of their escapes. Years later, in 1872, he would publish these eyewitness accounts in his massive landmark work, The Underground Railroad. William Still, although he was a free man living in Philadelphia, uh, his family had risks because his mother had been a, was a fugitive. Uh, her, some of her children had been born in slavery. And if she were uh, ever found out, or if the, her owner had made a big attempt to come after her, um, she could have been returned to slavery too. So he was often leading a secret life. He had to keep the family history quiet uh, while he was, he was working. And he was at some risk at, of keeping all of these records too, because the records were clear evidence of this scale of, of help that they were giving. William Still was at the hub of one of the Underground Railroad's most critical routes, the Eastern Line. It stretched from Maryland's eastern shore through the length of Delaware into the free state of Pennsylvania and on up to Canada. The Eastern Line covered a grueling distance of some 150 miles, made up of vast open fields, pockets of forest, and thick marshland. How did a fugitive slave know where to go? They did it through instinct and the will to be free. Uh, and usually they came to an area, an African-American community. It's sure some of them at times were directed to certain homes of whites, whether Unitarian, whether Quakers or others. But on the whole, they made it on their own. Now, if you were trying to escape to the north, particularly through Delaware, you generally came from the eastern shore of Maryland or from the eastern shore of Virginia or from areas further south. It was very difficult to escape slavery, however, if you lived in South Carolina or in Alabama, or Mississippi, or Florida, because you had to go through so many slave states to get to the North. Most fugitives simply set out walking to freedom. At the onset of the Eastern Line, much of the landscape looked the same, making it easy to become lost, or worse, to unknowingly circle back. For obvious reasons, most fugitives traveled at night, navigating as best they could through treacherous terrain and winding waterways. And in truth, many were taught to look for the North Star and to follow the Drinking Gourd, another name for the constellation Big Dipper. Group travel was discouraged, as it might draw suspicion. Do you run away with your children knowing that with a child along, your chances of success were greatly diminished? Especially, for example, if they were babies. I mean, how do you tell a baby not to cry? A strong individual might make as many as 18 exhausting miles in one night before sunup. Only about 5% actually made it to freedom in the North. They were primarily young males without family attachments. One of the greatest supporters and station masters along this route was the formidable Quaker abolitionist Thomas Garrett. Thomas Garrett was headquartered in Wilmington, Delaware the last stop to freedom on the Eastern Line. As a young man, he successfully intervened in the unlawful kidnapping of a free black woman who worked for his family. From that moment on, Garrett committed his life to abolishing slavery, like abolitionist Nat Turner, John Brown, and Harriet Tubman. Garrett believed he was divinely inspired to mediate in this great injustice. Garrett had little patience for slaveholders. Uh, he had little patience really for anybody who didn't believe in the immediate emancipation of slavery. Uh, and, and this really made him unique, I think, uh, among Quakers because uh, he had an uh, insatiable uh, integrity uh, when it came to this particular issue. Uh, and he took it to the highest levels. An iron merchant of modest means Thomas Garrett's home was located two strategic blocks from the Wilmington Riverfront in an area known as Quaker Hill. Garrett had long assisted fugitives making their way from this last critical stop to a network of Quaker abolitionists in nearby Chester County, Pennsylvania, and beyond. 
We need to know that Thomas Garrett was totally committed to helping the runaway slaves, that he was emotionally tied into this. It dominated his life. And therefore, when he helped a runaway slave, he had to know that that slave was going to receive the best attention that he could get. And he knew that if he sent it to William Still, that's what was going to happen. Garrett and Still may never have met face to face, but their extraordinary collaboration and ensuing friendship resulted in the safe transport of thousands of fugitive slaves. They supported the heroic work of Harriet Tubman, including the safe rescue of her own mother and father. Garrett would send a trusted person uh, with the letter often and would introduce the person who was bringing the letter and would say something like, this is a trusted, uh, trusted friend. Uh, could be an employee of his, could have been a free black man who was, who was regularly helping out. Um, so he would introduce people to William Still. Dear friend William Still, since I wrote to thee this morning informing thee of the safe arrival of eight from Norfolk, another man from Lower Delaware arrived since noon. Our friend Harry Craig will take the man, woman, and two children from here with him. Thee may take Harry Craig, Craig by, by the hand, hand as, as a, a brother, brother. True, true to the cause. cause. He is one of our most efficient aides on the railroad and worthy of full confidence. May they all be favored to get on safely. I hope herself and her children may be enabled to find her husband, who was sold off some years ago, and that the rest of their days be happy together. I am, I as, am ever, as ever thy friend, Thomas, Thomas Garrett. Garrett. Thomas Garrett would confront his greatest test of faith after aiding in the escape of a fugitive slave family in 1845. It was on this route that Samuel and Emmeline Hawkins, their six children and several able-bodied men, had set out one night from Queen Anne's County, Maryland. Crossing into Delaware, the family traveled north, stopping at the home of Samuel Burris in Camden. The free black community was the heart of the Underground Railroad. Uh, they did a variety of things. I mean, it is certainly true that the initial problem for a runaway was to leave the immediate local area and get into an area of freedom. But once you got there, your problems weren't over. A free black man and daring conductor on the Underground Railroad Burris eventually guided them to the home of the young Quaker, John Hun, in Middletown. They arrived on a cold December morning in 1845. But alas, it was determined that a neighbor had observed the wagon and persons walking with it, approaching the house, and had alerted a constable. Amidst many tears and lamentations, off they all went under the charge of the manhunters to Newcastle Jail a distance of 18 miles. The sheriff's daughter overheard these proceedings and immediately sent off a note to our reverend friend, Thomas Garrett. Through attorney John Wales, he was able to obtain a writ of habeas corpus from Judge Booth of Newcastle. The judge discharged the prisoners at once as being illegally detained by the sheriff. He then granted Garrett permission to dispatch a carriage to transport the fugitives to his home in Wilmington. He was paradoxical in the sense that he was a very powerful and even at times intimidating individual. Yet to those who he befriended, he was extremely gentle and soft-spoken. But when he went against the slave hunters and the slave catchers, the slave masters, he was bold, fearless, and defiant. Thomas Garrett and his co-defendant, John Hun, were tried in the Newcastle courthouse for their part in helping the Hawkins to escape. The decision went badly for Garrett, the fine imposed nearly equaling his total wealth. In typical fearless fashion, he asked to address the courtroom. Look at the nations around us. The cause of freedom is progressing with railroad speed. Their object is about to be accomplished. 
I have not read the signs of the times correctly if the days of slavery in this country are not numbered. The South will have to yield to the growing anti-slavery feelings of the North and the West. Or before 10 years from this date, there will be a dissolution of this union. Well, I hope, sir, that you are satisfied and will not meddle in this matter of slaves again. I have assisted over 1,400 slaves in 25 years and might view the penalty imposed as a license for the remainder of my life. But be that as it may, if any of you know of any slave who needs assistance, send him to me. For I now publicly pledge myself to double my diligence and never neglect an opportunity to assist a slave on his way to freedom. Garrett was down, but not out. His friend Samuel Burris was not so lucky. Samuel Burris was a black man who was born free in Delaware. Sometime as a young adult, he moved up to Philadelphia. Samuel Burris felt very strongly about the institution of slavery. He wanted to do what he could to free blacks from that institution. And so from time to time, he would cross over the Mason-Dixon line, the southern boundary of Pennsylvania, into Delaware. But in 1846, Samuel Barris had some bad luck. He went down to Kent County to help a number of African Americans escape from slavery. He was captured by the authorities. They gave him a trial. He was sentenced to 10 months in jail. And then after the 10 months would be up, he would be sold as a slave to one of the deep southern states. Later, William Still would faithfully record details of Samuel Burris's ordeal. At last, his trial came on, and the court decided that he must be sold in or out of the state to serve for seven years. John Hun and Thomas Garrett were as faithful to him as brothers but no change, pardon, or relief could be expected from the spirit and power that held sway over Delaware at that time. Finally, a faint ray of hope was entertained. Isaac Flint, an uncompromising abolitionist living in Wilmington, was elected to buy Burris at the sale. His cool bearing and perfect knowledge of what he had read of the usages of slave traders fitted him to play the part. When the hour arrived, the doomed man was placed on the block. Of course, Flint had left his abolition name at home and adopted one suited to the occasion. That Quaker who had been sent down to, to try to help out Samuel Burris outbid the other slave bidders and got occupation of Samuel Burris. 500, I have 500, I have 525. Burris held up heroically, but when the crier's hammer indicated the last bid, he labored under the impression that his freedom was gone. A few moments were allowed to pass before Flint had the bill of sale for his property, and the joyful news was whispered in his ear that he had been bought with abolition gold. And then Samuel Burris was whisked away to the north, and Samuel Burris never again went south of the Mason-Dixon line. It was a close shave. The following year, in 1849, a diminutive slave woman from Bucktown, Maryland, would find the courage to say, no more. Guided in her own words by the voice of God, she set out on a historic journey to freedom that she would repeat many times. She was such a great humanitarian that she went back into enemy territory time and time again. 
Some say 19 trips, but it really doesn't matter. The fact is that she went back. She had the courage, the will, the spirit, and the determination to free her family and others so that they could feel the same freedom that she had felt. On at least eight of these trips, Harriet Tubman would meet Thomas Garrett. When she started going back to bring more people uh, out of the Eastern Shore, uh, she needed financial backing. She needed places to stay. She needed contacts, and Garrett was that, that contact. Thomas Garrett had money. He had social position. And as a result, he was giving Harriet money. He also gave her um, passageway and shoes, and as well as clothing and food. He would tell this story in his letters to two ladies in Scotland who were sending money over to Harriet Tubman, how she came to his house and practically demanded money. She would say to him, for example, well, I know you've got money for me because God said so. And he would tease her. He would say, well, how do you know I got money for you, Harry? And you know, I give my money to most of the black people here in Wilmington, and I don't have any money. She said, oh, no, you've got money for me, and you've got shoes because God told me. And he would be nonplussed at her saying this, but he, he would have it. In 1850, the second federal fugitive slave law was passed, further vindicating the property rights of slaveholders. Armed with federal law, they could freely proceed into the free states to retrieve their human assets. Not only did it not allow those who were accused of being a fugitive to testify in their own defense, to have a trial, to have a lawyer, or to even be brought before a court, one of the things it did was to provide uh, that people on the street could be deputized on the spot and impressed into service in the capture and return of fugitives. Thomas Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln's father, actually served on these patrols in uh, Kentucky, even though he owned no slaves. It was sort of a militia draft uh, requirement or service uh, that was required of all citizens. Well, this strengthened that provision on the federal level. You could be deputized on the spot and you could be jailed and fined if you refused to participate in the capture and return of fugitive slaves. Now that spoke directly to white people and as many white abolitionists argued, was an infringement upon their individual rights. This was a slave power reaching out from the South and grasping not only slaves, but citizens of the North who had to participate. Resistance on the Underground Railroad intensified. In September of 1851, Maryland slaveholder Edward Gorsuch traveled to Philadelphia hoping to recover four of his runaway slaves. He enlisted the help of local lawmen and kidnappers, eventually tracking two of the slaves to rural Lancaster County and the home of William Parker in Christiana. Parker was a former slave who headed the local Freedom Society. William Still had learned of these events and warned him of the posse's approach. A confrontation ensued and quickly escalated. Parker's wife sounded an alarm summoning an armed force of area residents, the great majority of whom were free blacks, prepared to resist to the death. A gunfight followed, and Gorsuch was killed. In all, 38 people were arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit treason. In an unusual decision for the time, when the first two were found not guilty, all were released. The incident became known as the Christiana Riot. It was the first armed resistance to the new fugitive slave law. The idea of the slaves being docile and submissive is something that has to be re-examined. As a matter of fact, I think many historians are really uh, exploding that myth today. They were really actively involved in helping slaves escape and doing all sorts of things. They were harboring them in their house they were putting lights in their window. They were pretending to be docile, many of them were. And in cases where they had to uh, fight, they fought. They shot their way out of slavery. They hid in swamps. They, they disguised themselves, men dressed as women, women dressed as men. William and Ellen Craft were slaves in the state of Georgia 
their desire to be free was very strong, and for this jewel, they were willing to make any sacrifice or to endure any amount of suffering. As Ellen was fair enough to pass for white, they decided to act the part of master and servant. All that was needed to make this important change was for Ellen to be dressed in a fashionable suit of male attire in a style usually worn by young planters. By muffling the face, it appeared as though the young planter had a toothache. With his right arm placed carefully in a sling, he would not have to write or register as they journeyed north. He would further appear to be lame and hard of sight, a young gentleman very much indisposed who need only put on a bold air of superiority and be dependent upon his servant. Arriving in Baltimore, the ticket master informed them that a bond was required before a ticket could be issued for any Negro traveling north. William responded that he knew nothing of the rule, but that any delay would endanger his young master who needed medical treatment in Philadelphia. Without further parley, the ticket master waived the rule and the young master and his faithful servant were safely in the cars for the city of brotherly love. The desire for freedom could not be dampened. Determined slaves continued to take their chances on getting north, finding new and ingenious means of escape. Henry Box Brown was a man of invention as well as a hero. He was an unhappy piece of property in Richmond, Virginia, when he decided that he could no longer remain in the condition of a slave. Brown hit upon a new invention altogether, which was to have himself boxed up and forwarded to Philadelphia. The door was locked. Mr. McKim rapped quietly on the lid of the box and called, All right? Instantly came the answer from within, All right, sir. I will never forget that moment. Please to meet you, sir. I waited patiently on the Lord, and he delivered. Yes, sir. <laughs> With the help of his abolitionist friends, Garrett had recovered from his financial losses. Activities on the railroad were now particularly dangerous. Defiantly and quietly, Garrett instilled correspondence, sometimes daily, at times more often, to assist the flood of fugitives that continued to flow northward. They've developed a great respect for each other, and their letters were uh, always addressed dear friend or esteemed friend. Um, yours in the cause of the oppressed, uh, in the cause of humanity, and they began to see themselves, I think, as equal partners in this, uh, in this work of freeing the oppressed. With the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, the fundamental conflict between free and slave societies was given a voice. It was broadcast by the thousands of copies that were sold during its first year of publication. Membership in local anti-slavery societies in the North increased, but pro-slavery forces hung on, and in 1857, were further encouraged by the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case, ruling that the language in the Declaration of Independence did not apply to blacks. The building of the myth of racial inferiority in some ways becomes the most destructive, long-term, destructive effect of slavery. See, if we had just been able to argue that slaves were held in bondage because those people who were the masters had the power to do it. Well then, when that power was no more, when slavery was abolished, it's over. But see, we had to concoct a different story. We had to concoct a story that said these people are being held in bondage because somehow these people are themselves fitted for this position. In an effort to survive and sustain hope of living better lives, enslaved Americans eventually turned to a higher power. What evolved was an original and dynamic method of worship that blended the African soul with Christian dogma in a prayer for justice that would surely reach up to heaven. <laughs> 
For black people along the Eastern Line, the movement toward religious independence had been more successful. In 1813, Peter Spencer, a former slave, coalesced the African-American independent church movement when he founded the Union Church of Africans in Wilmington. A year later, Spencer's church would organize the Big Quarterly, an annual African-American celebration of solidarity and freedom that continues to this day. In those days, um, it was the faith, you know, it's like um, the old song goes, sometime I feel discouraged and think my life in, is in vain. Then the Holy Spirit revived my soul again. There is a bomb in Gideon. The bomb is a healing. There's a spiritual healing that we believe on, believe in, but they had no one else to trust. Independent black churches would evolve to play a central role in Underground Railroad activity, providing not only prayer, but also safe havens and critical resources for fugitives along escape routes. Most importantly, they would become the caretakers of oral tradition, an invaluable tool and source of record in a time when most slaves were forbidden to learn to read or write. We could be punished for reading during slavery. So all we had was the lessons and the stories that we could tell those who came after us so that they could pass on bits and remnants of our history. In 1859, as candidate Lincoln warned that a house divided against itself cannot stand, the national debate on slavery escalated into preparation for war. Americans on both sides openly prayed for vindication. For those enslaved, the answer to prayer continued to come in the burst of courage that enabled them to flee north. For religious crusader John Brown, it came in the form of a fateful decision to fuse an uprising that would once and for all put an end to the ungodly institution of slavery. His forces established, Brown intended to use the Underground Railroad for his supply line. Interestingly, um, John Brown had come to Philadelphia to seek support of the African-American community and uh, still was one of three who attended a meeting with John Brown and still was not uh, enthused about it. Uh, he was concerned that any provocative action like this, um, John Brown was trying to provoke a slave uprising, that this kind of action would endanger the Underground Railroad. In the early hours of October 16, 1859, John Brown and his small provisional army of the United States seized control of the armory at Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Federal troops from neighboring states quickly arrived. By the next morning, 12 Marines, led by Robert E. Lee, broke into the armory and took the badly injured Brown and his raiders into captivity. And in his papers was a note uh, wrote today to William Still. Um, many people encouraged Still to flee um, the country temporarily. Harriet Tubman was sent to Canada during this period to put her out of harm's way because John Brown had met with her. And uh, but Still did not flee. And in fact, um, some of the men who had helped Brown came through Philadelphia and were hidden by Still and Letitia in their home. So even though he thought this was a bad idea, uh, he risked his life uh, and his family to protect some of the men who had participated in the raid. Before being hanged on December 2nd in Charlestown, a resolute Brown stated, you may dispose of me very easily. I am nearly disposed of now, but this question is still to be settled. The Negro question, I mean. The end of that is not yet. Fearing the compromise of railroad activities, it is thought that in the days following Brown's execution, the aging Garrett burned the letters he had accumulated from William Still. William Still hid his correspondence from Thomas Garrett in a cemetery and would recover it after the war. Garrett's warning, issued at the conclusion of his trial, now rang true. 
Every sentiment of my nature is opposed to war, he wrote in a letter to William Lloyd Garrison. But non-resistant as I profess to be, I have not been able to see how the North could have avoided war. It could not. The issue of slavery had indeed divided the Union and initiated a vicious conflict in which more Americans would die than in any war before or since. By the time the war began, there were approximately one half million free black people living in America. We know that uh, on June 20th of 1862, Garrett led a small committee of progressive friends to the White House to meet with President Abraham Lincoln. And uh, Garrett and these other friends sympathized with Lincoln uh, over his particular position of having to fight a war uh, to preserve the Union. But more important in that meeting, Garrett and the others uh, pointed out to Lincoln that it was hypocritical, really, to fight this kind of war with this kind of bloodshed and not emancipate the slaves. On January 1st, 1863, a resolute President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. But the war would drag on for more than two agonizing years before the South would surrender to the North. News of emancipation would not reach slaves in Texas until June 19, 1865, more than two months after the war ended. Juneteenth is the day that many slaves in some areas, um, especially down in um, Texas and Louisiana, found out that they were uh, free. Slaves found out that they were free. But in many areas, that was also true. It was true not just in Maryland, but also in Missouri and the other border states. William Still's work at the Anti-Slavery Society slowed during the war, and he left to form his own business. A successful entrepreneur, Still remained politically active, and in 1867, propelled the passage of state legislation requiring streetcars in Pennsylvania to carry passengers of color. Thomas Garrett, more than 30 years older than Still, was now nearing the end of his life's journey. But the two great station masters would share one last common cause, ratifying the 15th Amendment, which would give black men the right to vote. They collaborated in a way that uh, I think was, was unusual. I don't think we see it again uh, in American history until the 1960s, during the civil rights struggles of the 60s, when uh, the cause of justice is so clear uh, that it brings people together. On January 25, 1871, at the age of 81, Thomas Garrett died. News accounts reported that thousands of mourners, black and white, lined the streets for half a mile and overflowed the meeting house to which his body was borne on the shoulders of his black friends. In the spring following Garrett's death, the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society convened for the last time. One of its final tasks was to commission William Still to formally prepare an account of the work of the Underground Railroad. Still succeeded beyond anyone's expectations, publishing a 780-page volume the following year. Self-marketed, the Underground Railroad was a national success. In 1902, William still died. Like his friend Thomas Garrett, he was 81 years old. America today remains a great social experiment. Peopled by the world, it labors to fulfill the pledge of its founders to the least of its citizens. I think by looking back at the legacy of slavery and at what happened afterwards, once African Americans were freed, they were still third-class citizens here in the United States. If we feel that the past explains the present, we want to make sure that our future is not going to be explained by our present, that we have to make some changes. Each year, 
On the anniversary of Thomas Garrett's death, community members gather at Wilmington Friends Meeting to remember the man who devoted his life to helping those he called God's poor and to abolishing that greatest of all evils, slavery. A new dramatic musical celebrates the remarkable life and work of William Still and his family and inspires audiences to learn more about this great humanitarian. And in communities throughout the country, societies have formed to study and to honor the work of the woman called Moses. In many ways, the most daring and courageous conductor on the Underground Railroad. The real numbers of fugitive slaves and the numbers of those who conducted them may never be known. For the success of the Underground Railroad depended totally on secrecy and trust. Here, both fugitive and free Americans were, for a critical time in history, drawn by a cause that impelled them to come together. There have been times in American history when we have been able to form alliances cross racial lines. The fact is that we don't hear as much about that as we ought to. And it's important that we do, because it's awfully hard to imagine that we can form racial alliances in the 21st century unless we understand that there is a strong tradition that we can draw upon. And although there have always been hostilities, there have always been difficulties across racial lines, there have also always been some people who were able and willing to put their fortunes and their lives on the line for other people. And I think that's a tradition that we need to draw on. That's a tradition of the Underground Railroad. You can visit the program website to learn more about Thomas Garrett and William Still.